The Old Testament is a collection of 39 books that spans the period of about 1,500 years of history, from about the time of Abraham to the time of Malachi, the last book in our Old Testament. And the Old Testament is made up of a handful of different collections of writings, the first of which we refer to as the Pentateuch. This is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the books that contain the initial history of the creation of the earth, God's choice of Israel as a people to be his divine representatives on the earth, his setting up of a covenant to establish them as his people, to represent him to all of the nations of the world, and their re-ratification of this covenant before entering into the promised land. The history books spanning from Judges down through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther at the close of the post-exilic period of the Old Testament give us the coverage of time after Deuteronomy until the close of the Old Testament historically. From there, we get the poetry books, Job through Song of Songs, spanning a, a wide range of time that covers a lot of poetic interpretation of history and the history of Israel's worship before God, both at the tabernacle, corporately, and individually from people like David. The books of Isaiah through Malachi cover a long tradition of the prophetic period, covering about 350 years of time that were all spoken during the reign of the kings of Judah and Israel. The collections of the prophets are categorized as the major prophets, which are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Lamentations is associated with Jeremiah, and then the minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi. And the only difference in the major and minor prophets are the size. Each message is important for the people of God, and they value all of the prophets, no matter how much they wrote or how little they wrote. The Old Testament starts where you would expect it to, in the beginning. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he saw that it was good. He placed man in a garden and gave the instructions to both Adam and Eve to take care of the garden and to look after creation. He gave them an instruction to be fruitful and multiply, to take care of the space and cultivate it so that it might bear fruit and grow, and to eat not of the tree of the good, knowledge of good and evil, for he said, in the day that they ate of the tree, they would surely die. And as Adam and Eve were present in the garden, there came a serpent along in the garden to tempt them, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That God wasn't really telling them everything that he had said to them. He was withholding from them something that they should have for themselves. And so Eve took from the tree, ate of the fruit, and gave it to her husband, Adam, who was standing right there with her. It is from that moment that they realized their nakedness, covered themselves in shame, and God comes into the garden searching for humanity. He comes looking for Adam and Eve because he realizes what they have done, and they hide from him and begin to blame each other because of the disobedience that they had walked in before God. God gives a couple of curses to each one, including the serpent, but also a very important promise, the promise of redemption. This is the first promise in the Bible, in chapter 3 of Genesis, prophesying the coming of a Messiah, Jesus Christ, that there would come a day where an offspring from humanity would crush the head of the snake. From there, Adam and Eve are sent out of the garden, and humanity demonstrates that sin was not an isolated experience in the garden in front of a tree, but it begins to spread to all of humanity until the point where a flood is sent upon the earth and God redeems humanity through one family, Noah. And from that point, we continue to see that the wiping out of all wickedness won't necessarily resolve this issue. And so those questions of how can we get rid of sin will not come simply through the removal of humanity, but there needs to be one who comes to deal with the issue itself. After the flood and the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, the confusion of all of the languages of the earth, God calls one family, 
the family of Abraham. And he calls Abraham and speaks blessings over him and gives him promises, one of which goes all the way down until the New Testament, that all of the families of the earth will be blessed through this one man's choice to follow God. Now, Abraham, we don't know if he had heard God before. In fact, the book of Joshua tells us that he was worshiping idols when he was called by God. But God called him to go, and Abraham went. And it is because of his step of obedience that then God's promises continue to go to father after father after father in Israel's history, to Isaac and Jacob, and then passed on to all of the sons of Israel. Now, after the time of Jacob, there became a great famine in the land of, in the land of Israel. And they were searching for food, and they returned, went down to Egypt to go search for grain that Joseph had stored up for them after he had been sold into slavery. Through many courses of events, Joseph brought his entire family down to live in Egypt. And over many hundreds of years, the Pharaoh had observed the growth of this people in the land of Egypt and had determined that they would be a threat to the nation and so enslaved them. Moses was born into a time of infanticide in Egypt where the Pharaoh was having all of the Hebrew boys slaughtered. It is through the salvation of Moses bringing up and being raised in the family of Pharaoh and then going out and observing the Hebrew people that Moses realizes the call of God upon his life to be a deliverer. But Israel does not yet recognize it, so he flees into the land of Midian. It is at Mount Sinai after 40 years of being a shepherd in Midian that he sees a burning bush where he's called by God and God reveals himself as Yahweh. From there, God calls Moses to go to the land of Egypt and to free his people from slavery. And it is there that God reveals himself and shows who he is to his people, freeing them from slavery and taking them to set up a nation and a covenant at Mount Sinai with the children of Israel. And this is where God's next step in his plan of redemption begins. Because God shows to the people that his desire is to dwell in their midst in the tabernacle that he wants to provide a way for them to restore relationship through the sacrificial system, and that Jesus Christ will bring fulfillment to the presence of God in their midst, as John will tell us in the beginning of his gospel, that Jesus dwelt among us. And as John the Baptist tells us at the beginning of the gospel of John, that Jesus is that Passover lamb who will take away the sins of the world. Israel wanders in the wilderness for 40 years after their encounter with God at Mount Sinai, and they wind up at the edge of the promised land in the book of Deuteronomy, ready to go in to the land that God had promised to them. Joshua records the story of Israel entering this land and receiving the promises that God had made to Abraham when he had first come to the land that was known as Canaan, but will become the land of Israel. After the time of Joshua, the land was not fully conquered, and God said to the people that he was leaving nations in the land to train future generations, and so that they might take the land and own the promises of God for themselves. And so brings the time of the judges. Now, the judges are not judges in a courtroom. The word judge simply means military leader. And so what we see with the time of the judges is a time of incredible disobedience. The people of Israel walking away from God time after time, and crying out to him for salvation and God's faithful deliverance of his people by raising up an individual to deliver them. And then they fall right back into the same cycle. And Judges just cycles down further and further and further until we get to the end and everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. And what the book of Judges points towards is the need for full submission in walking, to God, walking with God as the king of the nation. But the people see it another way. They need a human king. And in the book of Samuel, right at the end of the time of Judges, the people cry out to Samuel to tell him that we want a king so that we might be like the other nations. And that is the most offensive thing to God because his desire was that they would be different from all of the other nations around them, that they would be his representative and that he would be their king. God gives them a king with the plans and intentions, knowing what king he will bring after Saul. And as Saul fails in his kingship, 
David is raised up as a king to replace him, a king who is a man after God's own heart. And David sets an example of a man, not who's perfect, but a man who is repentant and who will constantly return to God and to follow his ways. From David's desire to build a temple, God comes to David and gives him the promise of the eternal kingdom, a promise that David will always have a son on the throne, alluding to the coming of Jesus Christ, who will come in the line of David and who will sit on the throne of God for all of eternity. From there, David, although he wanted to build the temple, was told that he would not be able to. And so he gathers all the resources so his son, Solomon, might build the temple. And it is during the early years of Solomon's reign that Solomon constructs the temple, a dwelling place for God in the midst of Israel, as he had promised in the book of Deuteronomy. And while Solomon's reign was wonderful at the beginning, prosperous, and Israel grew to the largest extent that it would ever grow, and the wealthiest that it would ever grow, Solomon was led away from God. And instead of remaining faithful and true to God all the days of his life, he began to walk away into idolatry. And it is from that place that God promises the kingdom will be split. And it will be taken away in the time of his son, Rehoboam. And it is during Rehoboam's reign that the kingdom of Israel is split into two separate nations. And ten tribes go into the north region, and they will be called Israel for the remainder of the Old Testament. And in the south, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and some Levites who join along with them as well, will be known as the nation of Judah. And so from the time of Solomon until the fall of Israel and the fall of Judah, these nations will be distinctly separated never to be reunited in this period of history. And so these nations will run in tandem to one another. Each one of these kings in the book of Kings is gauged on how they were obedient to God and walked in the ways of his covenant. Sadly, all of the kings in the north did not walk in the ways of the Lord, and each one of them is said to have followed in the footsteps of their father, Jeroboam, who had set up the golden calves so that Israel might not go back to Yahweh in Jerusalem. In the south, the kings are both good and evil. Some of them follow the ways of David their father in leading the nation towards righteousness, and others follow the ways of the idols of the nations around them. What is God doing throughout this time period? Is God silent? Absolutely not. The prophets are God's mouthpiece to the nation. And the prophet's primary role is not to speak the future, but to reinforce the covenant and what God had called his people to initially. They come as a reminder of what God had set up, and they often speak of reminding them how God had called them out of Egypt to be a people, to be Israel, his representative. He had given them a covenant of ways to follow and walk with God as a people who showed his light to the world around them. But the people didn't listen. And the prophets were often rejected. They would speak to the masses, and nobody responded to their message. They seemed to be failures in the eyes of the world, and yet were successful in their obedience before God. But that did not lead the nation into repentance. They didn't listen to God, and they didn't listen to the prophets. Israel, because of the extent of their rampant disobedience and idolatry, is exiled. They're taken away from their land and they are deported throughout the Assyrian Empire, which spans the ancient Fertile Crescent into eastern Turkey and down towards the Persian Gulf. And Israel is spread all throughout this empire, never to return. They are dispersed in such a way where they integrate with the nation. And these tribes become lost to history. Judah doesn't last much longer, though they do last because of their repentance and obedience to God. The nation of Judah will last until 586, when the nation of Babylon will come up and attack Jerusalem, and the prophets interpret this attack upon Jerusalem as God's just punishment of his people because of their disobedience to the covenant. Babylon takes Judah away from their land in 586 B.C., and they bring them to Babylon, not dispersing them throughout their empire, but using them instead as slave labor to build the city of Babylon and the infrastructure. They are in exile for more than 60 years before 
the Babylonians are destroyed by Cyrus the Great and the Persian Empire. Now, it was in this time, a time where we don't have much history of what's happening in the Jewish Empire, or Jewish nation, and their presence in the Babylonian Empire, that they begin to repent and change their ways. They recognize the failure that they had walked in as they followed the idols of the land and did, did not listen to the prophets and disobeyed the covenant. It is after this point that Israel returns to the land after the decree of Cyrus gives them permission to return and rebuild their temple and to rebuild their cities. They return and never again will the nation of Israel fall into the same sins as they had prior to the exile. In fact, Israel will maintain a committed obedience to God as a nation faithful to him. It is during this time that we get the books of Ezra and Nehemiah telling us of the restoration of the people of Israel as they rebuild the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem under the guidance of prophets like Zechariah and Haggai and finally Malachi, who looks towards the close of the Old Testament. Now, as Israel had returned, they are confused because God's presence is not filling the temple the same way that it had when Solomon had dedicated the temple and was so thick in their midst that the priests could not even stand to minister. And at this time, as they rebuild the temple, they are left wondering, what will God do? Haggai promises that the latter glory will be greater than the former glory, looking towards the filling of the Holy Spirit, not of a physical temple, but of the temple of God's people, his building. And with Malachi closing out the Old Testament, he looks towards the promise of restoration, where man will be restored to their fathers and ultimately to their heavenly father. There are three tips I'd like to give you for reading the Old Testament well. The first is considering historical narrative, the second is considering poetry, and the third will be considering Old Testament law, which you will get a video on. So let's focus on the first two. The first is that the Old Testament is primarily written in narrative style. And the Old Testament narrative will read differently from the New Testament. In the New Testament, you might come to an epistle and you read a paragraph and it's so chock full of information you don't know what to do with yourself. You might feel overwhelmed at how many things you're being told in just a few brief sentences. The Old Testament narrative is not going to read that way. When you engage with the Old Testament and you read a whole story, there might be one point. The Old Testament authors are not trying to inject truth into every single sentence of their writings, but they're trying to tell a story. And it is through that story that we often learn the greatest lessons. And so with the Old Testament writings, you must think much bigger picture at what is trying to be communicated through this one story. And so in the New Testament, it can be helpful to read one paragraph at a time. In the Old Testament, it is much more helpful to read one chapter at a time, as that way you will get the entire story that is being told to you. The second would be having to read poetry. Now, in English poetry, we tend to rhyme words that sound nice together and have flow to them. Hebrew poetry doesn't necessarily carry the same rhythm or tone or rhyming in the original language. In fact, the authors of poetry in the Old Testament are primarily focused on the rhyming of ideas, which is why you will read things such as, God is my rock, God is my refuge. These type of things are meant to rhyme ideas in your brain, not necessarily with your mouth. And so when you read the poetry of the Old Testament, which is dominant all throughout the prophets and the wisdom literature and will be sprinkled throughout the Old Testament narratives, what you want to primarily think about is the imagery. What is the imagery that is being conveyed? Because poetry in the Old Testament is not necessarily literal majority of the time. Only a handful of times will you find such things. Mostly what you will see is the metaphorical language that's being used. Something that's trying to create a picture in your mind and that will help you to understand and to read not only the prophets better, but also the narratives better. One last thing with the poetry, as the prophets write, you will find them very different from the narratives. The narrative will be a continual flow of story that builds upon each other and is one literary masterpiece. The prophets, on the other hand, might write in such a way where their oracles are compartmentalized. And you might read one oracle and that is one speech of the prophets, and it might not connect with the next one after it. These are often grouped together as speeches of an individual prophet. 
that helps to give a broad collection and understanding of what the prophet was talking about. So I hope that helps you to engage with the Old Testament better.